Blog Talk Radio. live well in just a moment I'm going to be bringing on Rory Friedman she is the author most well known for um, Skinny Bitch a bestseller but she also did uh, co-wrote Skinny Bitch in the Kitch Skinny Bitch Bun in the Oven and Skinny Bastard uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with her her work I definitely recommend taking a listen um, she is an outspoken vegan, and I'm really excited to have her on today. If you have any questions, please feel free to call at 347-884-9533. That's 347-884-93... Sorry. <laughs> it's one of those mornings. 347-884-9533. Um, if you have questions for me or Rory... Definitely give us a call, and hopefully she'll be joining us any second now. Let me see where she is. There she is. Okay, let me bring her on. Good morning, Rory. Good morning. I hope I'm not late. <laughs> well, I actually just sent you a, an email, ah, but it, it's it's fine. Oh, sorry, How are you this morning? It's okay. Ken and I could hear you, but you couldn't hear me. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think there's a delay on when people call in before it shows up on my switchboard, so... I'm here um, now. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining me today, and I'm sure my listeners are excited to hear all about you and what you're up to these days. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. Um, for those of you, for those of my listeners that might not know who you are, can you give a little quick background about you? Um, yeah. Let's see. I should start with like the important stuff, like the fact that I'm a Libra because I think that's very gripping. Um, <laughs> I wrote a book called Skinny Bitch, and then uh, a few follow-up books in the same vein, Skinny Bitch in the Kitsch, uh, Skinny Bitch Bun in the Oven, Skinny Bitchin', and Skinny Bastard. And um, I know the titles may sound off-putting, um, but really I just sort of sat down one day and said there's so many problems here with the way we're eating, with the what we're eating, with the way we're treating the animals we're eating, with what's happening to the environment, and I really felt strongly that if people knew exactly what it is that they were being a part of and how they were treating their bodies, that they would do it different. They would they would make different decisions and choices. But I just thought there's so many amazing books out there, and some of them just aren't getting picked up because they're not flashy. They're not getting people's attention. So I had the idea that if I wrote a book and I gave it this silly, crazy, ridiculous title – People would pick it up and read it, thinking it was one thing, and it would be the old bait and switch. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think it worked. Yeah, I mean, it has been effective, and I think it's unfortunate and telling that, you know, that's what does work in this day and age, but I think it was, you know, just a strategic choice in order to get the most people to pay attention. And I'm, I'm so glad you're doing it. How, how did you start off with the, your animal rights activism and becoming a vegan? I started 16 years ago. I mean, my whole life I was an animal lover, and I was raised by parents who were animal lovers, and we had a dog and cats and birds growing up. Um, but I also ate meat for every single meal, and I never thought anything about it. I just kept calling myself an animal lover and was none the wiser. And one day in college I met a friend, um, or I met a friend, and you know, she eventually told me she was vegetarian, and I was kind of jealous of her, and I thought, wow, she's actually a bigger animal lover than me because I would say, oh, I love animals, but I could never stop eating them. And then, so that was the first seed that was planted. That was my friend Tracy Silverman, who is still one of my dearest, closest friends to this day and the hey, first Tracy. vegetarian I ever knew. <laughs> and then um, oh, then I got a magazine in the mail. I was in college. I got a magazine in the mail from PETA, 
people for the ethical treatment of animals. I had probably made a donation to them or some other organization, just, you know, got something in the mail. And they sent me a magazine. And in this magazine, there was an article about factory farming and slaughterhouses. And up until then, I just had no idea what I was a part of when I was eating my my precious, beloved meat. And um, that was just the biggest wake-up call of my life. I, I just sat there reading this article about how, you know, on factory farms where 99% of our meat comes from in this country and our dairy products and our eggs, animals are confined in such small, tight spaces that, you know, um, the the egg-laying hens cannot even open their wings or spread their wings all the way. Um, they're packed into cages so small that each one is sort of relegated to um, the space that's the size of a piece of paper for their entire lives until they're slaughtered. Um, cows can often not turn around or lie down. Same thing with pigs. It's just it's horrifying. And anybody, you don't even have to be an animal lover. Anybody who has any sense of decency or compassion for any living being, if they saw what was going on in these factory farms and on these slaughterhouses, they would be completely horrified. Um, and again, you know, there I was in college holding that magazine in my hand, and, and I was totally horrified. And I just sat there sobbing, and I just said, never again. I will never be a part of this ever again. And I became vegetarian in that instant, even though I had meat in my refrigerator and in my freezer. Wow. So that was the beginning for me. Yeah, I um my first exposure to vegetarianism, my best friend in middle school was raised vegetarian and she would actually come to my house to sneak meat <laughs> and not oh, let her <laughs> Yeah, like and she would tell my mom, Please don't tell my parents that I and she would like chow down on McDonalds and um but it got me curious and uh I made the commitment um the summer I was turning fifteen and uh, yeah, PETA, PETA was one of the things that helped me stay with it. PETA was just getting um, started at that time, and it was based out of Rocksville, Maryland, and I grew up about 15 minutes from there. But um, they, thank God that uh, they were around, because I don't know if I would have lasted, especially the high school years. They are such an amazing group, and I want to talk about PETA for a minute, because I know so sure. many people have this idea that PETA is this terrible organization and that everything they do is ridiculous and preposterous. Um, or they don't even really know exactly why they don't like PETA. It's just sort of become this thing, like, unfortunately, there's you know some celebrities out there that collectively we decide we all hate and we all badmouth them, and it's kind of the same thing for PETA. And I actually experienced this firsthand. I was doing a protest um, with PETA outside um, on a, a KFC on Sunset in Hollywood, and this guy was inside eating, and it was just like a businessman, and he was inside eating, and, you know, I saw him watching us and kind of curious, and he came outside when he was done eating, and he and I started talking, and he asked me, or, you know, he said to me, I appreciate that you're taking your time to come out here and do this, but I don't necessarily agree with what it is that you're doing. And right. I said, well, what is it that you think I'm doing? And he really didn't know, and he was hemming and hawing, and then he finally got honest with himself, and he said, well, I, wow, I guess I really don't know, and you know, he sort of just realized that because it was a PETA demonstration or because it was a demonstration, he thought, this is uncomfortable, this is bad, I don't like this, these people are bad. So when I explained to him, you know, KFC is, you know, doing these terrible things with all their chickens, the way they kill them is really inhumane. There's better methods. Um, that if There's a method called controlled atmosphere killing. It's certainly not cruelty-free, but it's less cruel than slashing these chickens' throats. Um, and he said, oh, wow, okay, yeah, I could certainly get behind that. Um, so I just I want people to know that PETA absolutely is a wonderful, amazing organization. Yeah, they do the same kind of tactic that I do, and not to say that I did it first by any means. Um, <laughs> they, you know, they do the bait and switch too. They get these ridiculous, stupid ads out there. People get up, you know, all up in. Um, I don't remember the expression I feel like using, but they get all crazy about it. You know, hearing what PETA's up to or seeing these ads, saying how offensive it is. Then they go on PETA's website to write hate mail or to click on the ad because it is so controversial. And then they wind up watching footage of, um, you know, video footage of factory farms and slaughterhouses, and their lives are changed too forever. So I love PETA. I love them. Yes, I know. We When when we uh, first met, we discussed our adoration for Ingrid Newkirk, the founder. Oh, the, I, the, the first time I met her, I made a fool of myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was uh, before the book had come out, or maybe I had just gotten the idea to write the book, and she was doing a book signing, and I had just moved to L.A., so it was probably more than five years ago, and I was like, my throat was cracking, my voice was cracking, my throat was closing, <laughs> my eyes were filled with tears, and I was like, oh, you changed my life. <laughs> I went vegetarian because of you. <laughs> And, uh, oh, I didn't cry, crazy. but I was I was definitely stumbling on my words the whole time, like, oh, thank you, thank you, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's just tired, you know, obviously I've, I've met her since then and talking, spoken to her since then, and, you know, she's just a real deal. She doesn't want accolades, she doesn't need the attention, she doesn't need it, doesn't want it. All she wants to do is help animals, and she is tireless and fearless and I mean she's just never going to give up ever 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 and I'm so thankful for her her drive and the work that she does for animals she's incredible yeah the passion there and I think as you were saying about PETA people people have this uh this uh, negative opinion of PETA but I know PETA's also had a huge impact on making sure our beauty products and home products are cruelty free and I don't know any other organization that's pushed for that to happen I mean I know when I first stopped eating meat, it was almost impossible to find um, shampoos and so forth that weren't tested on animals. And I, and now it's commonplace. I mean, even going to a regular non-health food grocery store, you see that stamp. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, they. A lot of people, I think, just don't really know exactly what it is that they do. They only see those those controversial ads or or in the news you know they got they get mocked sometimes or scorned because it's an easy news piece for the you know the newscaster to roll his eyes and say those PETA protesters again (laughs) but I think you know if anybody who loves animals heard of what PETA was actually doing day in and day out they'd be impressed and does that mean you'd agree with every single one of their tactics and no there's a lot of animal rights organizations that do things in their own vein you know humane society is, is, is one that does things entirely different than PETA, and they're also effective. Um, does it mean that we should bash PETA and throw the baby out with the bathwater? In my opinion, a big definite no. Yeah, absolutely. So I know um, you have some helpful hints and tips for people who are sort of thinking about giving up eating meat or animal products in general, and I, I'd love for you to share a couple of them, some easy steps. Cause yeah, I know it's, it's it can be when you first come up with that, thought like I know you probably felt the same as me it's like oh my god how am I going to do this and how am I going to go out to eat and it can be kind of overwhelming and the societal pressure to to keep eating animal products is so intense so if you could share a couple yeah, I'd be happy to it's funny people. that it's I'm, I wonder if people listening thinking what well, societal pressure but it really does exist and I think it's a fascinating look at our society when people do say to their friends or their family, I'm trying to be vegetarian for now, and people freak out. They really do. I just had um, friends visiting, and my friend's husband um, has just decided to try going vegetarian. And they were out to dinner, and his family was giving him so much grief. And and they're not even like, you know, this meat and potatoes Midwestern family farmers. They're just regular cosmopolitan people who, you know, live in a, in a, a city. And they just were not handling it. Um, so I think the first and foremost is to just really be firm in your convictions and, and know why that you're trying it. Um, you know, there's so many good reasons to become vegetarian. For me, the first one and the most important one and the one that keeps me on the straight and narrow every single day of my life is the ethical reason. You know, I don't want a single living being tortured or slaughtered or confined or exploited just because their meat tastes good in my mouth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for other people, it's the health aspect because it really is so much better for your body to be a vegan. Um, and the third one is the environmental reason. You know, it's just the number one um, contributor of global warming is animal agriculture. So, I mean, those are the three primary reasons for going veg. And I think, you know, whether it's all three or one, two, whatever it is, know what your reasons are. And then it can be overwhelming, and I definitely hated when I first went vegetarian because I wanted to still eat meat, and I knew I couldn't. Um, I think video footage is always a really helpful motivator, and PETA has an amazing website for that. Um, visit goveg.com. You can get a free vegetarian starter kit. It'll have recipes. It'll have facts and statistics that'll be really helpful. I think reading a book on the subject, whether it's you know Skinny Bitch or Skinny Bastard or something more intellectual like the China Study, um, there's just so many great books out there, and I think that having that 
inspiration and that motivation really does seal the deal so that it's not something you're fighting against. It's something that you want to do because you're kind of grossed out or compelled or convinced that this is the best way. And then from there, the thing that I recommend more than anything else, and I hope that everyone listening today will try this, um, I always, when I'm speaking publicly or when I meet people, I I try to get them to give me a pinky promise that they're going to do a 30-day veg pledge. And the reason for this is, you know, saying something, making a pronouncement like, I have to be a vegetarian now for the rest of my life, it's kind of daunting and it kind of freaks people out. But if you just say, I'm going to try this for 30 days. I've never been a vegetarian before or I did it before and I didn't do such a good job of it. For 30 days, I'm not going to eat any dead animals and I'm going to see how it feels and see, you know, it's probably going to be hard, but I bet by the end of the 30 days I'll be good at it and I might like it. And it's really empowering and it is really life-altering. Oh, absolutely. I know when um, I decided to stop eating meat, it took me a couple of years to give up fish, which is a whole other story we can talk about, but... um, I decided to do it for a summer, and I uh, I uh, remember thinking, like, okay, I better research this a little bit, because I just kind of decided, like, to do it. I don't know. I think my friend kind of inspired me, and I was really into the Smiths, so Meat is Murder, the, that album really uh, inspired me as well. And then I started reading about it, and I think getting that knowledge about how, how it affects um, animals and the planet um, ha, ha, can have such a huge impact, but starting off with just for me, it was thir- it was 90 days, and uh, I never I never looked back. So I like yeah. I like your 30 day pledge. It's really I smart. think that's a great idea. Summer, you know, from you know, I actually did a, a no sugar fast once. I tried to not eat sugar for six weeks. I did try it. I succeeded in not eating sugar for six weeks. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And at the time, it was. Um, I think it was October, so I said, you know, I'm not going to eat sugar until Thanksgiving. So, yeah, pick a, a doable a doable goal, but make it a minimum of 30 days and stick with it and, and note the way you feel different. And don't expect it to be easy. You know, it might be challenging. For some people it is easy, and, and they feel like they were born to eat that way right off the bat, and or they're already close to eating that way, and it's no big deal. But, you know, I was just a terrible eater. And I used to eat fast food every single day, and I just was an entirely different animal. So for me, it was hard. Um, But I don't know if I had the expectation it would be hard. I don't think I had any expectation because it kind of got, you know, just lumped on top of me. But just know that it may be challenging and too bad, you know. It's like sometimes you decide you're going to go to the gym every day for 30 days, and there are days you don't feel like going, but you go anyway. And there may be days that it's challenging, and just um, I always like to think of that book, um, The Road Less Traveled, and mm-hmm. that part of the book, you know, and I, this was when I was breaking up with a boyfriend at the time, and it was so hard, it was so painful, but I knew we weren't supposed to be together. And in the book, he talked about delay of gratification. Be willing to say, this is going to be hard right now. I'm going to be unhappy. I'm going to struggle. I am going to have longings and cravings and desires, but... In the long run, I'm going to be better. So I'm going to delay gratification for now, and I know eventually it's the right thing and it's a good thing. So I'm going to put off being happy now so that I can have long-term happiness in the very near future. Oh, I I, I love that piece of advice because there's such emotional attachment to food, mm-hmm. and I I meet I've met so many people over the years who do the whole like, well, at holidays, I can't give up turkey. You know, it's just. I can't give up that tradition. Mm-hmm. So I, I, uh, it's funny. I remember having that same exact feeling like, this sucks. It's Thanksgiving, and I don't even get to eat turkey. And that was you know, 16 <laughs> years ago. And now, and not too long after that, maybe it was two Thanksgivings after that, I started to look at the turkey on the table and think, this is really sad. Like, all over the country, there are millions and millions of turkeys being killed today. And, you know, all these millions and millions of turkeys were living in these terrible you know, confined factory farms up until the point that they were killed just so that we could all eat them today. And it made me feel really sad. So Yeah, it's heartbreaking, yeah. especially because the, with a turkey, it's, you see the animal. I mean, when you hide it in a burger, you mm-hmm. know, you can kind of convince your your brain, like, oh, this isn't really a dead cow. But mm-hmm. the, the turkey right there in front of you, and I remember watching my mom, like, take the guts out and put the stuffing in and... Ugh. <laughs> What are we doing? That's so gross. Yeah, I never thought I would get to that place where I thought it was gross. You know, I used to just think, this sucks, I want to eat meat. And, you know, I used to think maybe once a year on my birthday I'll let myself eat meat. But 
my friend Gretchen, who's um, a fellow animal rights activist and vegan, you know, she was talking to another friend of ours once who was also vegan, but she had this problem. She could not give up um, Girl Scout cookies. Like once a year, she would she would eat Thin Mints, and she felt bad about it. So she was talking to our friend Gretchen about it, and Gretchen just said to her, you know, she's like, it's just once a year, and I know it's not nice, but blah blah blah. And Gretchen just said, well, what gives you the right? What gives you the right? And it's like, just because it's once a year, what gives you the right? You're still contributing to the torture and slaughter of another living being. Yeah. What gives you the right? And I just think that's really powerful, and I'm happy to say that our, our friend has stopped eating Thin Mints, and she doesn't <laughs> do it anymore, and she feels great, and there's you know vegan versions of everything out there on the market, that, so there's really no excuse. Oh, and thank God for that. I've noticed, especially the last few years, the options have have quadrupled or even tenfold what they were five, even five years ago, mm-hmm. the options. And I had Day of Cheese on my show on Wednesday, this past Wednesday. Oh, I love that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we shared some addiction stories on that interview. <laughs> oh, I love Day of Cheese. <laughs> it's the best. I actually want to talk about addiction now that you mentioned it um, because okay. when I went vegetarian, I, in the back of my mind, you know, when I first went vegetarian, I didn't know about the dairy stuff. I just thought, you know, I'm not eating dead animals. Thank God I've I've gone vegetarian. I'm not contributing to any animal deaths. And I thought cheese was fine and eggs were fine. And, of course, you know, later I learned that cheese and eggs are not fine, that the animals, you know, that are being farmed and killed, um, you know, to provide us with cheese and and eggs or or milk and eggs it's not it's not a good situation but when i kind of learned this you know deep down in my brain i kind of pushed the information away and pretended i didn't really know it because i was so addicted to cheese and it just didn't really dawn on me that i was actually physiologically addicted to cheese um and neil barnard the um president of pcrm the physicians committee for responsible medicine they're a great group you can check them out at um, pcrm.org he wrote a book called Breaking the Food Seduction. He wrote a lot of books, and he's actually an incredible writer and a, a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, but Breaking I ran the into him at real. I, I run into him at Real Food Daily every once in a while. I'm like, do I go up and say something to him? <laughs> oh, he's the nicest guy in the world. He's, he's, I probably he's, should say hi. Could not be nicer. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure he'd be happy to come on your show too. But um, he wrote this incredible book called Breaking the Food Seduction, and in the book he talks about the the actual physiological um, component of milk that that is addictive and you know basically this is how he breaks it down and it's to me so compelling we're mammals and you know every mammal on the planet when we give birth we produce milk for our young and whether it's human milk horse milk cow milk zebra milk whatever it is there are all these things in there um, there's this milk protein called casein and when casein breaks down in the body it releases these opiates and the reason for this is so that it ensures that young will feed from their mothers because they become addicted to these opiates. It's like giving your baby a little vial of heroin every time you breastfeed them so that later when that heroin wears off, they want more. So they start crying and the mom says, oh, my baby's hungry. Um, it's not so much hunger. It's that they now need another fix of that heroin. So. The same exact thing happens when cows are nursing their young and and all those other mammals, except with cheese, that casein is even more concentrated than it is in milk. So we're getting, you know, I'm going to make up the number, but like quadruple or, you know, 10 times more of those opiates when we eat cheese. So we are actually getting, you know, a high off of cheese and we actually are addicted to the cheese and we want more, more, more. And once I learned that, I just thought, wow, that is really gripping. No wonder cheese is so hard. And it just made things easier. Once you know what it is that you're battling, I think it makes it easier. You know, you have to know your opponent. Oh, absolutely. And I, that was that was definitely eye-opening for me because one of one of the hardest things to give up was um, was cheese. And I still, I will admit, I still <laughs> cheat every once in a while. You can lecture me on that I'll well, I won't say anything except the words <laughs> of my friend Gretchen. What gives you the right? I know. What gives I know. You well, the now right? that I have Daya, I, I, uh, it's that that addiction is gone. It's it's incredible what it's yeah, done to me, it's and now I'm like, addicted to Daya instead. Yeah, it's a good addiction <laughs> to have. 
Um, so we only have a few more minutes. I want to make sure that you get um, any thoughts that you want to make. Um, have my listeners here get those points across before we oh, say goodbye. See, about, I'm never happier than when I am talking about animal rights stuff. I know that this is a health-related show, and but you know, for me, the, the primary reason that I went vegetarian is for the animals, and I have to say, as a result, my health has improved in miraculous ways that I I didn't care about, I didn't consider, I didn't think about or foresee. But, you know, we're spiritual beings in physical form. And, you know, yes, phys- physiologically our health is affected by what we're putting in our mouths. And, you know, I, I experienced that firsthand um, by changing my diet. But because we're spiritual beings also, we have to consider on a spiritual level, and I know this is going to sound a little hippy-dippy to some people, but... What exactly is it we're putting in our mouths and the energy of what we're putting in our mouths? And, you know, for example, if you are eating canned food, there's an energy to canned food compared to the energy of, you know, something fresh that you pull out of the ground or that you pull off of a tree right away. You know, the energy in the canned food is deadened where the energy of the food that you've just picked from the tree or that you've pulled from the ground is live. And now think about the energy of an animal that has been confined in miserable, desolate conditions where they have, are covered in feces and urine, where it smells like ammonia so bad that if you went in there, you had to have a mask on and your eyes would just be squirting uh, tears because of the ammonia um, in the room from all the feces and urine. Imagine if you were kicked and beaten and abused by farm workers and you were terrified for your life and then you were moved along in this kill line and that you were not stunned before that you were killed, before you were killed, or you weren't unconscious um, before you had your throat slashed and you were chained and hung upside down going through the slaughter line. And then imagine the energy of that dead flesh that you're eating. I mean, think about when you're scared or when you're upset, the chemical changes that happen in your body. Just when you're watching a scary movie or when you're in a fight with somebody and your blood is boiling and you feel all that stuff, you know, there's a physical change happening in your body. There's chemicals going on in your body. And it's the same thing for these animals. And we're eating that fear. We're eating that grief. We're eating that rage. And spiritually, I think it's showing in our culture and in our collective consciousness. I think that we're a really angry, sad group of humans right now. And um, to say, you know, veganism is going to solve every problem in the world, will it? No, but I do think that it has the potential to get us pretty damn close. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more because I I've seen when some of some of my friends give it a try or patients of mine because I don't push being vegetarian and vegan on my patients, but a lot of people do come to me with that issue since I'm one of the only pro vegetarian acupuncturists in LA and and the, it's incredible to see how their spirit lifts. It's not just the um, the physical changes that come with it, but they seem lighter because they're not taking on the suffering anymore mm-hmm. in their diet. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to separate the two. I mean, it really does make a difference. And I know for myself, who I was 16 years ago was angry, um, selfish, greedy, miserable, fearful, you name it. And I, and if it was negative, I embodied it. And yeah. just the sheer act of changing my diet and abstaining from animal products it really started me on this different path, and it's just changed who I am as a result. And I just I can't thank veganism enough for it. <laughs> yes. I'm so grateful, too. Well, thanks so much for coming on today, Rory. Thanks so much for having me. And I, I definitely want to have you on again so we can have more time because that went way too quickly. Not any time. Okay. Well, enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much. Take care. Oh, you know what? Why don't you give out your website really quick before we say goodbye? Oh, sure. It's uh, skinnybitch.net. Great. Thanks for all that you do. Thanks. You too, Heather. Bye-bye. Bye. So that was Rory Friedman, the co-author of Skinny Bitch and other best-selling books. Um, I love love her attitude and the way she just... um, can be really kind about her her passion or taking care of animals, but she can also really confront confront people, which I, I'm not so good at. So thank you, Rory, for all that you do. Um, next week I'm having on Global Green USA and Mike Gottlieb, who is the owner of a Platinum Lead house in California. 
Uh, if you have any questions for me or want to make an appointment, you can call my office at 310-259-5165, 310-259-5165. Uh, if you have any comments about the show today or questions, I would be happy to answer them. You can always email me through blogtalkradio.com, and have a great weekend.